born into a world where my last name opens more doors than I care to walk through, you could say I had it all laid out for me. My dad's the big boss of a company you've probably seen tick across the stock exchange screen more times than you've cursed the morning alarm. Yes, that kind of rich. But if you were expecting tales of a golden girl draped in designer and sipping champagne for breakfast, you've got the wrong story. Me? I've always kept it real, feet firmly on the ground. Money is nice, sure, but it's not everything. I chose a different path, one that's led me to places money can't buy and experiences no gold card can fetch. Charity work, helping those in need, and living a life that's well, ordinary. That's me, Emily, not the Aries, just Emily. So I was stuck in one of those typical evenings where my friend Samantha decided we all needed to get out more. We ended up at this dive downtown, the kind where the beer's cheap and the lights are dim enough to hide your regrets. Samantha was all hiked up, going on about some guy she met online. You've got to meet him, M. He's totally your type, she kept saying, as if she decided she knew my type. Anyway, we're there, and then walks this guy, not Samantha's online prince, but another dude Oliver. He was there with some friends, looking as out of place as a cat at a dog show. He wasn't dressed to impress, just a simple tee, jeans, and this easy smile that kind of lit up the room. We got to talking, and it was easy, really easy. He worked a manager job at a place I'd never heard of, nothing fancy, but he talked about it with this passion that was kind of infectious. Absolutely. Oliver shot back, leaning in. Every day's a challenge, but hey, I'm not here to bore you with work talk. What about you? Samantha mentioned charity work. I shrugged, trying to downplay it. Yes, a bit of this and that, just trying to do my bit, you know. That's cool, really cool, he said, and I could tell he meant it. Not in a trying to impress you sort of way, but genuinely. The night rolled on, our group mingling, but Oliver and I kind of stuck together, chatting about everything and nothing. It was refreshing talking to someone who wasn't trying to sell me on some investment or brag about their latest acquisition. As the night was winding down, Oliver got this look in his eye, like he was working up to something. Hey, Emily, I know this is kind of forward, but would you want to grab dinner with me sometime? Just us. I remember feeling this mix of surprise and excitement. Sure. I said, trying to sound cool about it. I'd let that. On the way home, Samantha was all jiggles and I told you so. I just smiled, thinking about the evening. Oliver was a breath of fresh air in my often too stale world. Little did I know how much things were about to change. It wasn't long before going out turned into hanging out at each other's places. Which, let's be real, mostly my cozy 27-year-old apartment, because Oliver's roommates were a circus and a half. One evening, sprawled on the couch after devouring what might be the world's most average takeout pizza, Oliver turned to me, his eyes serious but his tone light. Emily, how do you feel about making this a more permanent arrangement? He asked, crumbs still clinging to the corner of his mouth. I raised an eyebrow. You proposing we split a Netflix account or something more along the lines of a life together? he chuckled, brushing off the crumbs. Well, I was thinking more like a life together, but hey, we can start with Netflix. The simplicity of it, the straightforwardness, no grand gestures or dramatic backdrops. Just us in our element. It felt right. Alex, if you're asking what I think you're asking, yes. A thousand times yes. And just like that, with the aroma of cheap pizza as our witness, we decided to tie the knot. Telling our families was the next hurdle. My folks? Well, they've always been about the as long as you're happy mantra, but this was putting it to the test. Dad, with his business empire, and Mom, the socialite, they had visions of me settling down with someone more in our circle. I broke the news over dinner, the fancy kind where you're not sure which fork to use for the salad. Mom, Dad, I'm getting married to Oliver. Dad paused, fork midair. Oliver. The manager chap. Well, that's quick. Mom simply smiled, a bit too tightly. Dear, are you sure this is rather sudden, isn't it? 
but I was firm. Yes, I'm sure. He's amazing, and we're really happy together. Their skepticism was palpable, but so was their love. Well, if he makes you happy, darling, Mom conceded, and Dad nodded in agreement. Oliver's folks, on the other hand, were a whole different ballgame. We went over to their place, a cozy little house that seemed always to smell like fresh cookies or something equally comforting. Judy and Martin, they were as down to earth as they come, and they welcomed me like I'd always been a part of the family. Alex tells us you're setting a date, Martin asked, passing me a plate of those infamous cookies. Yes, we're thinking sooner rather than later. Small ceremony, nothing fancy, I replied, trying to gauge their reaction. Judy beamed. Oh, sweetheart, that's wonderful. We're just thrilled for you both. Their warmth was enveloping, a stark contrast to the cautious optimism of my own parents. It was clear right from the get-go that our worlds were different, but the common ground was the genuine happiness for me and Oliver. Planning the wedding, we were on the same page. Keep it simple, keep it us. A small ceremony, close friends and family, and an open bar, because as Oliver put it, if we're doing this, we're making sure everyone's having a good time. And that's how it went down. A swift engagement, not because we were rushing, but because everything just clicked into place. Amid the whirlwind, there were quiet moments, looks shared between us that said we were doing the right thing. And we were. We really were. Living with Oliver started off as everything I'd hoped for and more. We were like two peas in a pod, making our little corner of the world in that cozy 28-year-old apartment I had rented. It was ours, fiddled with love, laughter, and a ton of takeout containers, because, let's face it, neither of us were winning any awards in the kitchen. It wasn't long before I started noticing how Oliver's parents, Judy and Martin, had this way of dropping hints about things they liked or needed whenever they came over. At first, it was subtle, almost cute. Emily, that's a lovely coffee maker. Must make mornings a breeze. Julie would say, eyeing our shiny new appliance with a gleam in her eye. Or Martin, this sofa is just divine. Our old one's been giving me a right pain in the back, you know. Wanting to be the good daughter-in-law, I'd surprise them with gifts here and there. A coffee maker for Judy, a comfortable new sofa for their living room, and so on. Their initial reactions were always the same, a mix of surprise and a little bit of guilt. Oh, Emily, you shouldn't have. This is too much, Judy would exclaim, her hands fluttering to her chest. But you know, humans are funny creatures. Give them an inch and they'll take a mile. Those initial protests faded away, replaced by a growing list of subtle hints that were about as subtle as a brick through a window. Dinner at your folks' place was lovely, dear. Did you see that new TV they have? Crystal clear. Ours is practically ancient. Oliver would relay his parents' latest comments, oblivious to the change in their tone. One evening, after I'd just dropped a not-so-small fortune on a fancy new TV for them, Oliver and I were curled up on the couch, my head resting in his lap. They really love the TV, babe. You're amazing. You know that, he said, his fingers running through my hair. I sighed, the weight of their expectations starting to press down on me. Alex, do they expect us to keep doing this? It's getting a bit much, don't you think? He paused, his hand stopping mid-stroke. What do you mean? They're just happy, that's all. Happy or taking advantage. I pushed back, sitting up to look at him. It feels like we're their personal shopping service. Alex was taken aback, his brow furrowing. They're not like that, M. They're just not used to nice things, that's all. But where does it end, Alex? It's like they've got a taste for it now, and they're not looking back, I argued, frustration creeping into my voice. The conversation ended with an uneasy truce, but it was clear we were on different pages. Judy and Martin's gratitude had morphed into entitlement, and it was putting a strain on us, on me. I loved Oliver, but I wasn't about to become a bottomless ATM for his parents. When my dad's company hit the skids, it felt like the rug was yanked out from under my feet. That cushy life, poof, gone. And with it, the whole dynamic of my relationship took a nosedive. 
The shift wasn't gradual. It was like flipping a switch from daylight to darkness. I had to break the news to Oliver and his folks. Listen up, things are going to get tight. Dad's company's tanking, and well, we're in for a rough ride, I said, trying to keep my voice steady, but the tremor was there, betraying my nerves. Oliver's reaction was a gut punch. You're kidding me, right? What do you mean things are going to get tight? You're telling me we can't live like we used to because of your dad's mess? His words were like ice and for a second, I wish the floor would swallow me whole. Julie and Martin's faces were no better, their disappointment barely masked. This is quite the situation you've put us in, Emily. Martin added, his tone dripping with reproach. And just like that, the warmth and camaraderie we once shared evaporated, replaced by this cold expectation that somehow I was to blame for my family's financial downturn. Moving in with them was held up as a temporary solution, but our once independent life got swapped for a guest room that felt more like a cell in the house of the two people who clearly saw us as amusants. The atmosphere was charged with tension, every day a reminder that I'd somehow fail them. We're cutting back on everything because of this. Judy would remind me, her voice sharp as she served dinner, that was a far cry from the lavish meals we used to enjoy. And Martin, always with a comment on saving costs, make sure those lights are off. We're not running a charity here. But Alex, he was the hardest to bear. The man I married seemed to have vanished, replaced by someone who saw me as a letdown. Can't you do something? Talk to your dad. It's like you don't even care we're living like this. He'd snap, anger flaring over the smallest things. Our conversations, once easy and filled with future plans, now minefields. Every word I said was a potential trigger for another outburst. I thought marrying you meant security, not this. This struggle, he'd throw at me during arguments, his words slicing through me. It was clear we weren't just dealing with financial stress. This was a test of our relationship, a revelation of true colors under pressure. I was stuck in the middle, battling the disillusionment from my husband and his parents while grappling with my own sense of failure. Judy's birthday dinner was supposed to be this cozy family thing at some upscale restaurant, a break from the constant tension, but it turned into the showdown of a lifetime. I should have seen it coming, the way things had been going at their place. We're all sitting there, menu in hand, and I'm trying to keep the peace, just blend into the background. That plan got torpedoed the second the orders started flying. Alex, with this grin that made my skin crawl, goes, let's get the steak and the lobster for us. And Feroza looked my way, one part smug, two parts cruel. Emily can do with the soup of the day. Got to save where we can, right? They all laugh like it's the best joke they've heard in ages. Judy adds her two cents. Absolutely, can't have Emily overspending now, can we? I felt this flush of heat, not embarrassment, but pure fury. Really? Soup? What's this, some kind of sick joke? I snapped back, my voice sharper than I intended. Oh, come on, Emily. It's just a bit of fun, Alex said, that smirk still plastered on his face. That's when I lost it. Fun. This is your idea of fun. When the chips are down, you just show how petty you really are. I can't believe I fell for your act. You could hear a pin drop. The whole restaurant was watching now, the awkwardness of the charts. I'm not sitting back down. Keep your fancy dishes and your pathetic jokes. I'm out, I said standing up so fast my chair nearly toppled over. The noise echoed, turning more heads our way. Alex reached out, trying to play the peacemaker. Emily, don't, let's not make this a scene. A scene? You think I care about making a scene after that stunt? This is about respect, something you clearly have none of. I yanked my arm free and made for the exit, the weight of their stares on my back. Stepping out into the night felt like breaking out of prison, my phone was blowing up, Alex no doubt trying to do damage control. I ignored it, my mind made up. I drove back to their place, a storm of emotions brewing inside. How have things gone so sour? Alex and I were a team, or so I thought. But that dinner, it was a slap in the face, a wake-up call I couldn't ignore.
Back at the house, I packed my bags in record time, each folded shirt a reminder of the life I was leaving behind. It wasn't just about leaving a place, it was about leaving a relationship that had shown its true colors. I turned off my phone, cutting off the barrage of messages. The silence was eerie but welcome. That night wasn't just the end of a disastrous dinner, it was the close of a chapter I had no interest in revisiting. After the disaster that was Judy's birthday dinner, I found myself driving to my parents' house. The knife was quiet, a stark contrast to the storm raging inside me. By the time I pulled up to their driveway, my decision was made. I needed sanctuary, yes, but more than that, I needed advice, something only my dad could offer. Walking into the house, the familiarity of it all was both comforting and jarring. Mom was asleep, but Dad was up, sitting in his study, surrounded by papers that seemed less important the moment I stepped in. Emily, what are you doing here at this hour? Is everything okay? He stood up, concern etching his face. I took a deep breath, and the events of the evening poured out of me in a flood. I told him about the dinner, about Oliver and his parents, and how I felt like I'd been reduced to nothing but a source of income for them. Dad listened in silence, his expression hardening with every word. When I finished, he sighed, a sound that carried years of experience and a hint of sorrow. Emily, I saw this coming. I just hoped I was wrong. How could I have been so blind, Dad? I thought, Oliver, I thought we were different, I said, feeling the weight of my naivety. He walked over, putting an arm around my shoulders. You wanted to see the best in him, in them. There's no fault in that, but people show their true colors in tough times. It's a hard lesson, but an important one. I nodded, the reality of his words sinking in. But what do I do now? I can't go back there. You'll stay here for starters. He assured me, his confidence a balm to my frayed nerves. Then he shared something that took me by surprise. You know, the company situation isn't as dire as it seems. We're actually on the verge of a breakthrough. It was a strategic move, a way to weed out the opportunists. I stared at him, stunned. So you mean to say we're not broke? He chuckled, a sound that was part relief, part amusement. Far from it. But it was important to see who would stick around when the chips were down. Unfortunately, Oliver and his family showed their true selves. The revelation was a lot to process. My anger towards Oliver and his parents was now mixed with a sense of vindication. They have revealed their true motives, and in doing so, had freed me from a future of manipulation and deceit. Dad, I don't know whether to be relieved or furious. I admit it, the emotions battling inside me. Be both, he advised, grounding me. It's okay. But remember, this experience has taught you something invaluable about people and their intentions. Use it, learn from it. Walking up to Judy and Martin's house the next day felt like heading into the lion's den. I was ready for a showdown, but nothing could have prepared me for the cold reception I got. Oliver was standing there, divorce papers in hand, with a look that could only be described as triumph and disdain. Here you go, let's get this over with, he said, practically shoving the papers at me. His parents were hovering behind, barely containing their glee. Finally getting rid of the freeloader, Judy snickered, and Martin nodded in agreement, a smug smile plastered across his face. Yes, turns out you're just an ordinary dummy without your daddy's money, Oliver joined in. Thought you'd cry, but guess what, we don't need a tearful mess around here. Their words stung, but not in the way they expected. I felt a bizarre mix of anger and liberation. I looked at the papers, then at them, and without a word, signed where I needed to. As I did, their smiles widened, thinking they'd won, but I had the last laugh. Pulling out a newspaper from my bag, I slapped it down on the table with more force than necessary. Thought you might find this interesting. The headlines screamed about my dad's company making a monumental comeback, profits soaring higher than ever. Watching their faces drain of color was a sight I'd pay to see again. Judy and Martin's smugness vanished, replaced by shock, then desperation. Oliver's arrogance crumbled, leaving him looking like a child who just lost his favorite toy. 
Julie suddenly switched gears, stepping towards me with arms wide open. Oh, my sweet girl, it's all a big misunderstanding. Let's hug it out. Martin, ever the opportunist, chimed in. Let's not rush things. Sit down, have a coffee, and we can talk this through. And Oliver. Oh, Oliver, he was the picture of regret. I was wrong, okay. We can fix this. I want to make everything right, please. Their sudden change of heart was almost comical, almost. I couldn't help but laugh, a deep, hearty sound that felt cleansing. You three are something else, you know that. But here's a news flash for you. I'm done. Done with the lies, the manipulation, and the so-called family that only values me for my bank account. I turned to leave, their protests and pleas fading into the background. They called after me, a mix of desperation and disbelief in their voices, but I didn't look back, not this time. After the spectacle at Judy and Martin's house, I was done, not just with them, but with the whole sorry saga that had become my life. I needed a fresh start, a clean slate, so I took some time to hole up at my folks' place, getting my head and heart back in the game. One afternoon, a couple of weeks after the divorce was finalized, I was out for coffee with Sarah, my ever-supportive friend who had been there through it all. Girl, you look like a weight's been lifted, she commented, sipping her latte. I laughed, feeling lighter than I had in months. You have no idea. It's like I can finally breathe again. Sarah leaned in, her expression turning serious. So, what's next for you? Em, you've got a clean slate now. I thought about it, stirring my coffee absentmindedly. I'm not sure, but I'm excited to find out. Maybe I'll travel, pick up some of the charity work I had to put on hold. As for love, I paused, giving her a wry smile. I think I'll give that a miss for a while. Just make sure you're doing what makes you happy, okay? You deserve it after all that drama. Thanks, Sarah. That's the plan, I said, reaching over to squeeze her hand. Not long after that conversation, my phone started buzzing with calls and messages from Oliver. He was pleading, saying he'd changed, that we could start over. His parents even got in on the act, sending messages filled with apologies and invitations to talk things over. Sitting in my room, phone in hand, I couldn't help but laugh. The sheer audacity was almost admirable, almost. I typed out a response, one I'd been mulling over for days. Oliver, moving on means moving forward, not going back to what broke you. I wish you all the best, but this is where our path ends for good. Take care. Hitting send felt like closing the final chapter of a book I'd been stuck in for too long, and just like that, I was ready to start writing a new one. The next few months were a blur of activity. I threw myself into my work, took up volunteering with a vengeance, and even booked a solo trip to a place I'd always wanted to visit. Life was full, and for the first time in a long while, it was fulfilling too. One evening, sitting on a balcony overlooking a bustling street in a far-off city, I realized I'd found what I'd been searching for all along. Peace. The drama, the heart F, the betrayal, it all seemed like a distant memory. My phone buzzed with a new message, but this time it was from a number I didn't recognize. Hesitantly, I opened it. It was from someone I'd met during my travels, someone who'd made me laugh and think in equal measure. Hey, Emily, how about dinner when you're back? No expectations, just food and good company. I stared at the message, a smile slowly spreading across my face. Maybe it was time to open my heart again, but on my terms, at my pace. Yes, I'd like that. I typed back, hitting send before I could second-guess myself. Looking out at the city lights, I felt a sense of excitement for the future. I had moved on, not just from Oliver and his family, but from the person I was when I was with them. I was stronger, wiser, and ready for whatever came next. 